All right, let me welcome you to our, our sixth uh, uh, Powerhouse series. Um, we're Rational Games. Uh, I'm Mark Young. I'm German-American. I live in Berlin. I've been here 30 years. I uh, came when the wall fell down seeking my fortune. I'm still seeking. Um, and um, our company uh, teaches negotiation, leadership, storytelling, a few other things, but mostly negotiation. And we do it using playful methods. The idea is to use games and, and play to teach negotiation, not so much PowerPoint, not so much lecturing. Um, and we've taught in 37 countries around the world over 21 years. Um, we have nine trainers, one of whom is my esteemed colleague and friend who is next to me on my Zoom, and that is Philippe Gruca. First question of the afternoon, can anyone guess where Philippe is? We have backgrounds that reflect where people are calling in from. I'm in Berlin, obviously. And Philippe is where? I will the you make okay. myself bigger here and, and, and hide also. Maybe and to give a chance. Where that is. Just put it in the chat on the right. You get a prize. <laughs> Nobody? Two. Not far from Berlin. Ah, good. good uh, not far from Prague. Okay. Not far from there either. No. Yeah, Warsaw. Absolutely. Anna. absolutely. Yeah. Good for you, Anna. Super. All right. Yeah. So welcome. Um, uh, and um, uh, we always start every. Zoom uh, seminar over the last couple of years with a small exercise from um, improvisational theater, um, which is called Please to Notice. Uh, and what we'd ask you to do is think, if you could, of one thing that's happened to you in the last 24 hours that made you smile, that was positive. Please don't say the sun is shining, that's not good enough. It's gotta be something concrete. Uh, and then if you could just keep that in mind, uh, we'll demonstrate it a little bit and then we'll find a quick way to, to include everyone else. My pleased to notice uh, this morning is um, uh, that um, I, I live in Berlin on, on a modern square and they're having a big party this weekend and they're, they put up colored umbrellas on the whole square, like, like hundreds of them. And that's a very nice thing to see. It's very cheery and it's very fun and it makes one look forward uh, to the event. What I'll do now is get make a funny sound. Philippe will repeat the funny sound. If give you us can. To notice. And then give it back to me, and then we'll we'll proceed with everyone else. So, Philippe, your funny sound is. Ooh, ooh. It's it, this is this one is hard to make. Um, <laughs> all right, so my please to note is is I, I I'm living in Warsaw now because I'm taking care of my grandfather who's 97 year old and uh, soon 98 years old, um, and lately something he he just began to uh, uh, an opera. Uh, career because he's singing during the night where he cannot sleep okay. and uh, and he has a weaker voice the, this this last time but to today at five in the morning uh, i just heard book which is a christmas song in polish one mm -hmm. of the most operatic christmas songs so um yeah i was um <laughs> I was not very happy to be woken up at five, but on the other hand, it was nice to hear that he had some good energy for the start of the day. So that's that's my place to notice for today. And send me um, a sound back, please. Um, a sound back is... Um... All right, thank you. And normally we would go around the board now with everyone contributing. We don't really have time for that, but we want to do the express version. So what I'd like you to do is if you could click on chat, which is on the bottom screen on the right, um, and the uh, window will open on the right side, uh, put it on everyone. And if you could just think of your please to notice one sentence, something that happened to you, and, um, and uh, just think about it. Don't type anything yet, please. But just think about it and raise your hand when you're done. Something concrete from your life that we will make us all smile. Virtual hand or real hand? Yeah, either one, or whatever works for you. Remembering that virtual hands you have to take back down, they don't go down automatically. Yeah, give everyone a chance. Could be small, could be large. We've heard all sorts of things. Okay, got about half the room. Hank, Derek. Jane, Antonia, mm -hmm. Joshua, Chin Mei. All right. 
All right, I, what I'm going to do is count to three. And when I say three, press send all at once and we'll see what is in the room. One, two, three, go. Shrimp scampi from Jay Roderick. Surprise dinner. Wow. Oh, wow. A few emails. <laughs> a few emails. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what else? There should be more coming. Yeah. Hank buying chips for my partner. Hope for youth. Oh, very nice. Dinner with your girlfriend. That's good. Lovely thunderstorm. Very positive training feedback. Super, super woke. Sandstorm up. in New York City. From Sand? Oh, that's right. There is. I, I was reading about that. Uh, Remy, after we came back, our neighbors filled up our fridge. That's very nice before you came in. And son learned to drive the bicycle. Lots of good things happening. Um, Andreas, I'm very positive training. Air track to find his wallet. Okay. That's, all right. Super. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for doing that with us. We like to, to start with things like that. It is playful. But it's also rather serious because what we're doing is something called resilience training. It's all about training your mind uh, to think of something positive every day, no matter what it is. Um, it helps to uh, raise the mood in general. Um, I'm going to move over and just say a word or two about the Zoom board. You all know Zoom better than you ever wanted to, I would guess. Um, but the key buttons for today are the mute button on the lower left. Please keep yourself on mute so that um, we don't hear your washing machine and the traffic outside your window and those things. Um, uh, and if you want to speak, raise your hand like in school or use the reaction button, which is a little bit um, totalitarian because you can only um, agree with what we're saying or you can um, applaud what we're saying or you can celebrate what we're saying, but you can't really disagree. If you want to do that, you'd have to go to chat like we just did and just type things in the right side. And the chat will be very important today because we're going to ask you as, as we're speaking and discussing things, if you have a question, a comment, something to add, just put it in the chat, write it in. Philip is our technical host. He will keep track of that and we'll have a Q&A at the end and you, we'll go through what's in the chat and whatever else you can think of. Um, you have the choice between gallery view and, uh, and and speaker view. Gallery view, you see everyone like postage stamps and speaker view is, is the person speaking larger. We also use spotlight. So you'll see uh, people that are featured in the middle, like on the stage. And that's really kind of it for today. So let me tell you what this is all about. Um, we had a 20 year anniversary two years ago uh, in Bavaria for rational games, all our trainers and our board all came together. And we were thinking about strategy and you know how we raise our visibility and how we develop. And the idea came from out of the group, somebody said the word powerhouse. And we said, well, what do we mean by that? And And, and I've always been very shy about advertising myself. I don't really like that. Um, so I don't want to put things on Facebook like what did I eat for breakfast and where am I going tomorrow? So instead we said, why don't we connect with people that are more important than us, that are doing what we teach, that are really demonstrating some of the things we teach about win-win negotiation and so on and, and hear from them and, and, and learn from them. And so we decided to do that. And we've had five sessions so far. Um, with with, with a, a humanitarian interventionist from Afghanistan, with the uh, head of uh, Help Alliance at um, at uh, Lufthansa, because we are also a, a nonprofit. Um, we've uh, heard from Josh Weiss, who's on this call, who is the author of Real Time Negotiations, um, and we've heard from Uli Eger, who is the founder of Eger Phillips and Partner. Everyone knows the the Harvard licensee, and today we have a very special guest that I will introduce shortly. Um, but the idea is simply to, 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 to learn a little bit from them and then see how we can integrate that into what we do. So that's the background. And let me tell you about our guest. Dr. Remy Smolinski is a negotiation professor at HHL Leipzig Graduate School of Management. In his research, he focuses on theory and practice of negotiation, particularly in international settings and innovation management. Uh, he was a visiting scholar at Tufts University, Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, and at the Harvard Program on Negotiation. He is has held senior leadership positions in media, e-commerce, banking, and consulting companies, and actively advises his clients in complex negotiations and trains their executives. Dr. Smolinski has taught negotiation at leading business schools for almost two decades. 
He is the founder of the Negotiation Challenge, and we'll be hearing more about that, a major international negotiation competition for students and now also for professionals, as well as the founder and academic director for the Center for International Negotiation at HHL. Could you join me in welcoming Dr. Smolinski? <laughs> Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, well, um, did I really do all these things? <laughs> Apparently, I don't know. Looks <laughs> like yes. So, how are you? Yeah, uh, doing well. Just came back. Uh, just came back from a longer, uh, from an extended stay in the U.S. And uh, yes, my pleased to notice was indeed that uh, uh, our neighbors yeah. were so th so thoughtful that. Uh, uh, that they said they 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 filled up like our fridge with white wine and foods and and drinks so that we didn't have to go to uh, to a supermarket after we came back. So um, sure. and we came back. We arrived at uh, late evening or at night. So that was uh, well. You and, know, then some... always, and then it's always a German holiday, so you can't buy anything for three days. Exactly, exactly. So it it, it was. Uh, it was one of those moments when I, when I realized how blessed we are, you know, with the neighbors that surround us. Uh, uh, that's uh, it's an absolutely amazing uh, story about their um, uh, their kindness. Yeah, super. I want to jump right in um, uh, and ask you about your latest publication, which I think was in the Harvard Negotiation Journal very recently, a month or two. And you told me a little bit about it, and you created something called the Negotiation Competency Model. And as far as I understand it, you know, when I'm teaching seminars, we talk about, are you happy with your result? And then after that, I always say, and when should you be happy with your result? You know, <laughs> what is the normative foundation under happiness for results? And I don't really ever get much answers to that. It's it's fuzzy. And I'm hoping that your model might give us a little clarity. Um, and I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about it, how you came up with it, and what's the empirical basis, maybe something surprised you when you did it. I've got it on my computer, I can put it up and share screen if you like, or or just- talk. Sure, I can also I can also post the sure. link. Yeah. I can also post the link in the chat. So if, if yeah. someone is interested, you guys can uh, uh, can click on it and, 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 and draw through it. But in general, in general, we uh, it, uh, it it came out out of necessity, right? So we've been running a negotiation competition for, for I don't know, um, 15, 20 years now. And uh, it's a it's a key element, right? Uh, for some, uh, for, uh, for, or it has been a key element of the competition to be able to reward those who negotiate better than others. Yes, uh, and um, at some point we 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 realized that uh, 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 that there is uh, that there is that there are no fixed uh, commonly accepted standards, and despite two decades of, uh, or now four, almost four decades of research, right? So despite four decades of research, there, there, uh, we were not, as scientists, we were not able to come up with uh, uh, with standards that uh, for measuring negotiation performance, right? So for, and it's, uh, it's uh, how do I say this? It's, uh, it's very surprising, right? Because uh, even for such elusive skills, such as piano playing, right, uh, as, ice skating or dancing there are criteria there are judges and uh, this is a uh, this is ultimately a prerequisite for calling something a skill right we as professors or negotiation trainers have this um, self-serving definition a bit self serving definition of negotiation that it is a skill well it is, if it is a skill uh, then it has to be uh, then we have to be able to measure and compare it right otherwise it's not a skill right uh, uh, so and that was uh, that was the um, the idea behind setting up the competition and in the first editions we we did what is this what what, what is very simple to do and that is uh, we looked at the results yes so if a seller got an object uh, um, uh, compared to other sellers for uh, managed to sell an object for a higher price then that seller negotiated better than a seller which managed to uh, uh, which did not manage to sell uh, an object for a uh, for a higher price. Uh, the opposite goes for the bias, right? That's the most obvious criterion for comparing negotiation performance, yes, uh, uh, within roles. We only compare within roles in our competitions. So, um, and that was uh, was kind of um, not really satisfying for us. Yeah? So at some point, we also introduced uh, judges. And when we introduced judges, we brought we brought all those experts from around the world, right? That dealt uh, dealt with negotiation for many years and uh, claimed to have uh, so much experience. We realized that each of those experts has a completely different set of criteria uh, that uh, decide for him or for her um, which performance was better than the other. 
Yeah? And that was kind of uh, a major surprise in one of the first years of, uh, of the negotiation challenge. And we sort of thought, how do we reconcile those differences? How do we unify? Uh, how do we, is there anything we can do for the community to trigger a debate what it means to negotiate well? And then, you know, the process of coming up with a negotiation competency model was a, was a very long one because, uh, you know, what is uh, what we tried to do is we tried to look at uh, at papers that correlate observable behavior with superior negotiation performance, so that the judges, you know, when they when they see certain traits of observ observable uh, observable traits during a particular negotiation, can say, okay, when I see that, most likely, even if negotiation um, uh, results are not measurable, the results are not measurable. Most likely, the person who is displaying those uh, uh, those uh, observable traits, behavioral traits, is likely is more likely to arrive at a at a better result. So this is uh, this is uh, we started with collecting these papers and uh, and then structuring them and uh, and putting them into the buckets. And as a result, we um, we came up with uh, with um, with a small pyramid uh, and four meta competencies. Uh, uh, such as language and emotionality, something which we called negotiation intelligence, uh, relationship building, and moral wisdom. Uh, within those com uh, within those meta competencies, there are uh, there are fifteen, sixteen now. Uh, we we changed it since the paper is, uh, has been published uh, already. It's still developing for us. We're discovering uh, where uh, one of my uh, one of my PhDs is uh, doing research on. Uh, the ex uh, trying to figure out to what extent does it makes sense to attach weights to different criteria and so on, right? So it's still developing. Our intention was not to come up with a final answer. Our intention was to trigger the debate. And it's super cool to see that this debate is going on. Yeah? So some people object uh, to certain criteria. Some people say, well, negotiation is so elusive that you cannot capture it. Uh, you cannot um, um, capture performance in a, in a set of criteria. We've also heard those voices. But, uh, but then I say, well, how do we know uh, that you're teaching what it takes to be a good negotiator? Uh, because to, uh, to, be, to, to be able to do so, uh, we need to be able to somehow compare uh, to what the extent to which the participants in our training are able to have an uplift in whatever we call negotiation performance before and after our training. Yes? And uh, um, this is something which uh, has been... Uh, very close has been very close to my heart for many many years and something that uh, uh, that i hope uh, uh, maybe some of you guys in the audience help us uh, help us uh, develop uh, develop further it's just a starting point something that uh, uh, that we wanted to put out there and uh, uh, hoping for a for a good debate on what it means to to negotiate well so remy i'm wondering about the empirical basis of this i mean you've chosen four elements in a pyramid yes First question is why, why a pyramid? I mean, why is language at the top and moral at the bottom? And then why these four out of all the many things you could have? Why language, in negotiation, intelligence, relationship, and moral wisdom? How did you did you do clusters, or how did you get to those four? Yes, that's exactly what we did, uh, Mark. That's a very good question. Uh, <clears throat> so the pyramid uh, uh, pyramid uh, structure, um, let's say, reflects the easiness of um, uh, of observing certain things, yes, certain uh, certain traits. So language and emotionality is something that we easily, or the judges, or we can easily manage, um, uh, easily notice in a negotiation. So you know, so the extent to which questions are asked, the extent to which interests are communicated, and so on and so on. Uh, how well uh, negotiation intelligence? Um, it's something that the effects of which uh, we can observe in negotiations. So these are these are. This is the craftsmanship of negotiation. So, how do we, were the parties able to create value? Were they able to claim value? How how did value creation work? Uh, were they able to uh, uh, were they creative? Uh, um, did they open well? And so on. So, so how did they make trade offs? Were they post settlement settlements? There are, I think, eight or nine uh, eight criteria in, in that bucket. And then we said, well, obviously. Um, Final result is not the only thing that matters. Uh, also, uh, we need to also be able to um, um, to uh, assess the contribution to trust, trust, trust building, trustworthiness, and relationship building. That's where the next layer comes from. And something that uh, I think it's very hard to observe, and there, uh, but uh, is a basis of all. Yeah? It's uh, something which we call, called moral wisdom, yeah. that consists of uh, ethics and empathy. 
Yes, uh, ethics and empathy, super important uh, for us as negotiation negotiation professors, uh, because uh, you know my 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 motto is always uh, I would like to uh, I would like to educate negotiators that I would like to negotiate with at some point. Yes, and uh, and that happens. That has happened many times, uh, many times over the years. That uh, you know my former students at some point uh, uh, reach out to me and ask for training for the companies. Right, and we end up negotiating, negotiating, negotiating the costs or uh, um, or the fees uh, for 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 that training. Yes, uh, and I know in such cases that uh, that these uh, these uh, uh, these two, oh, well, they are not these alumni. Uh, alumni are um, uh, no, do, they do have what it takes uh, to negotiate good negotiation results. So I'm I'm very taken with the moral wisdom base, which is a little surprising, I would think. Um, um, and it's different from what I hear even at Harvard and most of the other win-win schools. I mean, the central place that you give to ethics, um, can you give us a little more? I mean, what, why is that? And yes. is, that, is that really ground everything else we do? I uh, would like to believe so. Yes, um, uh, ethics and empathy, that's uh, the two components that are hidden behind moral wisdom. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, if if we tackle to them uh, one by one, so ethics uh, is uh, the ability to stick to commonly accepted standards and norms. Uh, it's slightly different than morality, which is more individual. Uh, but ethics uh, ethics is super important, uh, in my opinion, um, as someone who uh, spends a lot of time uh, teaching young people, right, so how to negotiate or how to optimize their um, or adjust the behavior to become the best version versions of themselves right so i uh, would like to negotiate with uh, uh with uh, with alumni or with negotiators who um have a common basis right have a common basis and uh, which rests on ethical standards that are acceptable that are widely acceptable such as you know uh, uh such as uh, trust uh, such as uh, such as openness but not naive openness not naive trust yes and this is something that uh, uh something that uh, not only myself, but also many others, uh, many others warn against. Uh, and we also see, let's say, misinterpretation of ethics and and and, and trust in, in our competition, uh, right? So we do not mean, on the other hand, we also do not mean um, using them instrumentally. What, it, what we mean is that uh, having a certain, a certain uh, bedrock for everything that we do as uh, in negotiations. So do I, what information do I share as, uh, uh, do I allow uh, do I allow the seat in, in, in the information that I share, or do I not? Yes, or, or do I um, am I comfortable with exerting pressure on my negotiation partners and many 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 other many other aspects? Um, so my 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 my, my uh, underlying philosophy that uh, I'm trying we're trying to uh, convey in our competitions, which you know. The result matters, right? Because at the end, at the end of the day, someone is called the negotiation champion, right? Someone is then um, uh, receives the, the the cup. Someone is that becomes the winner. Yeah? So the question is, is it possible to stick to common uh, common ethical standards and show empathy, even if yeah, even if it's uh, the result matters? And the answer is clearly yes. Yes, and we've seen it. Uh, uh, we've seen it. Um, uh, over the years, uh, by design, it, it has something to do, of course, with the design of our competition, because we not only evaluate uh, the final result, but we also evaluate the relation or the parties evaluate that the, re the relationship that was built during the re during um, during the, um, the negotiation, which means that it produces a completely different dimension to negotiation performance. That means uh, if uh, a negotiation partner feels uh, treated poorly, unethically, feels uh, pressured, feels uh, uncomfortable in a uh, in a particular negotiation setting with uh, with their negotiation partner, well, they have a an opportunity to express it, uh, uh, and we use for it we use for it uh, Jared Carhans and uh, his co-authors subjective value inventory, right? We ask them to evaluate each other and incorporate that um, that they mention in uh, in the scoring of the round, and we consider it really important because it uh, it reflects the reality that we live in, right? So, uh, uh, economic result matters. This is what pays our salaries. This is what uh, 
you know, generates revenues for companies. This is what reduces costs if we look at procurement and so on, right? So economic results matter, yes, uh, both in the short term and in the long term, not only in the long term, also in the short term. It, it also matters. It's, uh, um, <clears throat> so we are not naive with, uh, uh, with, uh, with our underlying philosophy, but at the same time, we know that, uh, excuse me, or we try to teach or enforce um, value optimization or value maximization under the condition of relationship building. Yes, which means uh, we want to award, we want to appreciate, we want to reward also the uh, negotiators who manage to do both at the same time. Yes, meaning yet maximize their economic outcomes and not or and build uh, sustainable relationship with, relationships with their partners. And Maybe last, last sentence. I know I'm, I'm yep. slightly devi deviating from your question, Mark, uh, but it's it has uh, many many facets, uh, and uh, uh, and I wanted to make sure that uh, that it comes across uh, uh, is, is understood uh, um, as intended. Um, one of uh, one of uh, one of um, one of the uh, characteristics of the final res results that we see every single year. Okay? that uh, when we look at the as obtained SVI scores, that's the relationship score obtained from the negotiation partners, and compare them with the economic outcomes, such as you know, price, salary, contract value, whatever, yeah, we see that the winners are able to do both well at the same time. Yeah? This is not a contradiction. It no, is no. possible to maximize both at the same time get a good outcome for me yeah? and at the same time helping my partner like me or uh, building a good relationship yeah so here's maybe a curveball question for you because i agree with all of that i think it's fabulous um you know every seminar i give recently somebody will come up in the course of the seminar and say what do you think of chris voss <laughs> and then and finally, I, I had to go out and read, never split the difference. Um, and I have my own anecdotal answers to that. But I'm just amazed at the success he's had uh, in, in raising his brand. He's on LinkedIn every day. He's has a talk show. He's doing a master class. He's much more famous than either of us are. Um, and But he teaches something very different. He teaches what Anna just put in the chat. Um, it's manipulation. You know, he's teaching tricks. He's teaching how to trick the other person into releasing the hostage, which I guess is what you want in a one-time negotiation like that. But I don't think you're terribly interested in a relationship with, with the hostage taker later. What do you think? What, what can we say to Chris Voss uh, to uh, um, counteract this growing trend in manipulative negotiation? Yes, uh, well, it's a great question and a difficult one, uh, Mark. So um, <laughs> let me think how, how I answer this. Uh, so Chris, uh, first of all, I would congratulate Chris on his uh, tremendous success, right? I mean, he is uh, he has truly um, made our field larger. Yes, uh, because of his work, people started uh, getting more um, more interested in, in negotiation as a topic itself. Yes, uh, um, so that's that's something that uh, that has served us all, uh, I believe. And uh, I also have a one of his books uh, or that book. Um, uh, and, uh, in, Yes, exactly. Never split the difference in my, in on my bookshelf behind me, um, and at the same time, I do agree that uh, that life and business uh, has might have sometimes some parallels to hostage taking situations, to crisis situations. But uh, I hope uh, that we are not uh, uh, permanently in such situations. Yes. So um, there are, there are, there is merit in um, in what's written in the book. Although it's a collection of work that has done uh, has been done by many scientists uh, around the world in slightly different contexts, right? So uh, what is called the method is actually um, is actually a collection of uh, of uh, phenomena that uh, have been well known and and uh, described by uh, by. Uh, by many um, uh, before uh, Chris Voss, and some of the things which are uh, which are mentioned in the book are, according to scientific research, simply wrong. Such as, for example, uh, never to make the first offer. There is a there is a huge body of evidence uh, in in research which says that actually making the first offer is beneficial because it correlates with uh, positively correlates with the final outcome. 
So which means, uh, uh, and the only situation, the only situation into, uh, where making the first offer um, can have some drawbacks is when, when there's information asymmetry between the parties. And that is exactly what happens in the crisis uh, or cri crisis negotiations or hostage ta hostage uh, taking uh, situations. Uh, there is a huge information asymmetry between the parties, and I think uh, it's a it's a small exaggeration to uh, to extrapolate that particular n equals one to um, to make a general recommendation for all negotiators uh, so that's uh, um, um, there are, but uh, there are things that do have merit in in the book and uh, let me maybe uh, let me maybe share what i really like about uh, about never splitting uh, never splitting the difference it it shows it shows well it's it emphasizes that negotiators are comfortable and willing to make concessions if under two conditions if they feel that they have control over the situation yeah? and two if they feel comfortable with talking to the other to, to the person on the other side and this is this is exactly what i tell my students read the book make sure you know the science behind it uh, make sure you're able to assess critically what's uh, what's 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 right and what's uh, based on our current ev scientific evidence what's wrong but uh, think about these two dimensions and this i think these two dimensions are um, are very valuable for any negotiation right because uh, this this uh, regardless of whether it's you know it's a uh, uh, strictly distributive like crisis typically crisis negotiation right so uh uh, about uh, freeing uh, freeing hostages or you know making demands in exchange of uh, for freeing the hostages uh, um, but uh, I think we all like how do I say this uh, um, when I sometimes when I ask my students uh, um, what are the preconditions for accepting someone's request for a favor yeah? And they tell me, you know, different reasons. Some of them are very economic, saying, okay, if someone asks me for a favor, well, I would expect a favor back from him or for her, either in the short term or in the long term. Yes? And then they they, they give all, all sorts of other reasons. But one of those reasons is, I think, what's exactly behind that type of uh, uh, type of negotiation that uh, um, uh, that is, uh, let's say, universal, uh, universally, universal, universally applicable to hostage uh, um, procurement, hostage taking, crisis, uh, hostage taking, pro procurement, sales, and so on. And that is, um, we do make concessions or we do comply with those requests. We do make favors to all those who we like. Okay? And this is, although this is, uh, there is in economics, there is no equivalent of the concept of liking. Yeah? We do know that if we like someone, we are more likely to do what he or she is asking us to do, right? And this is exactly the the, the, the central point, one of the two focal points of uh, never splitting the difference or crisis negotiation is uh, so making sure that there is a connection or the, the, there is a connection between the hostage taker and uh, the police negotiator. That's number one. Number two is uh, uh, always giving, giving an impression that, uh, that uh, the person on the other side is in the full control of the situation. Yeah. it's uh you know it's um how can it be done well ask instead of telling right so one of the things yes make sure that uh, the person can speak up his or her mind make sure that they can express their uh their uh their interest make make sure that they feel appreciated and so on and so on so there are some universal elements of uh uh, that um, are applicable not only to hostage situations but also um in uh, to other negotiations uh, and um uh, this is uh, this is something that uh, uh, that I tend to believe it's um, it's uh, it's valuable uh, in the approach. Although I'm also a strong, uh, how do I say? Uh, 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 one more remark. Yes, it is also possible that the approach that Chris Voss uh, describes in his books and he teaches in his uh, in his classes somehow exceeds what we know from science that's also possible which means that there might have, we might have to invest some more research into understanding better um the methods uh, that uh, these guys have developed over the years yeah? to what extent they are applicable 
beyond the hostage taking situation yes to a wider in a wider uh in a wider setting and this is something uh, this is something that uh, has been buzzing in my mind uh, in my mind for a while already just uh, uh looking for a for a good phd to uh, to set up the experiments and and analyze the results so, uh, some of the things might uh, be universally applicable like the ones that we uh, that we uh, briefly discussed but some certainly aren't and and we're thinking about that as well at rational games and it sounds like we're back to your pyramid where it says relationship building is number two so yes. uh, although i would say that the relationship and he does talk a lot about relationships but it's mostly instrumental yes mostly getting this fellow to put down his gun and and, and cooperate Whereas I think in business, we're not quite as instrumental, I hope. And that takes you back to the moral wisdom, perhaps. Precisely, precisely. We have to watch the time a little bit, um, Grammy, but I do want to hear a little more about TNC because it's absolutely central to the negotiation challenge. Um, I had the privilege of being one of your judges in Rome a few weeks ago um, and was very struck by it. Um, you know, all these young people that were fully engaged over three days on a weekend um, and what I thought was interesting was it was an interesting mix between cooperation and competition. I mean, it was a competition. There were met, there were trophies on the table. Everyone was hungry for them, and the, the, in the final, they were very, very concerned. But there was a, a just a camaraderie in the room between all of them. And is that is that what you set out to do? Is to teach both, or to tell us more about TNC? And and I know that you you're going to have a session of TNC for professionals coming up. Maybe you could say a word about that. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, for um, uh, for this question. And thank you for supporting us with your uh, with your knowledge and experience in uh, TNC for students. Uh, so <clears throat> it's actually a trap, right? I mean, it's set up as a competition, but it's a competition in cooperation, right? <laughs> so uh, we do have uh, over the years we come up uh, we've come up with a with a with a competition design that promotes the values that we believe in. Yes. And the values that we believe in uh, were the ones that we discussed, right? So yes, um, economic benefits uh, are important. Yes, uh, it matters, you know, what uh, what you agree to at the end of the day, but it also matters what kind of a relationship you build. It also matters the judges in the finals, the judges will also observe the process and will evaluate how you go through, uh, through you know, from the beginning to the end of your negotiation, right? So it's a it's a it's a it's a small it's a small trap, right? Because the students think, well, at the first sight, those who uh, maybe don't do not have um, have not had uh, much exposure to nego to our negotiation competition, they think they need to crash the other side, yes, or crush the other side. They they think they need to uh, you know ex ex exert every single dime and penny and dime uh, out of them, uh, extract uh, uh, extract the last the last unit. You know, well, but that backfires very quickly because no one is happy with a relationship that is based on such premises, right? So this is uh, this is indeed a trap that we've set up. It sounds like a competition, but it's indeed a competition in the ability to. Um, to uh, optimize negotiation performance, not only on the economic, uh, in terms of their, eco uh, their economic value, but also in terms of relationship building and managing the process. Yes. Uh, so that's the first, and yes, uh, we've set up a similar competition for professionals and I'll share the link to, share a link to, uh, uh, to, to it uh, in, in the chat. It's called uh, TNC for professionals or professional.negotiationchallenge.org. And uh, we'll be running a, a larger, larger event later this year in the, in the, in the fall, uh, hoping to get uh, about 50, 60 teams. Uh, we have right now we have uh, those uh, uh, those teams uh, who who, who uh, uh, sign up for our waiting list will be eligible for a complete for a full scholarship uh, um, participation, which is free of charge. So you guys, if you know someone who knows someone who might be interested. Uh, Please feel free to forward them uh, the uh, the link to our waiting list uh, or to our website. Uh, and uh, um, our intention is to take the same the same philosophy, the same vision or mission, right, that we've established over the years in the in uh, in the competition for students and apply them to professionals to promote a certain way of negotiating, a certain style of negotiating, which is, as we discussed, based on solid based on ethics so which promotes relationships and so on but at the same time it's not naive right it's also it also leads to good economic results so um remy just uh, so that would include business negotiators like procurement and sales oh yes but yes. also diplomats absolutely we've had diplomats oh, we've business. had 
Yes, absolutely. We've had uh, in the past. We've had lawyers. We've had politicians. We've had diplomats taking part, uh, um, uh, taking part in our uh, in our. We recently in our competition for professionals. We recently got a uh, got an email from one of the EU institutions, which uh, is exploring sending their negotiations uh, negotiators to uh, to our competition as well. So it's completely open. And we say, if you have enough passion and you believe that uh, uh, that you would enjoy it, uh, um, go for it, register. Um, Shane has been there twice. Yes, exactly. Uh, and I think uh, um, it only fuels right this passion. It, all, uh, it only allows to live and meet people who, and Derek as well. Derek is our champion. I think uh, I saw him earlier in this call, Derek Pete. Uh, uh, and so we will have also a session with Derek and other champions uh, coming up at the end of June, where they will share, you know, how they got to uh, uh, to uh, to their championship, to, 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 to where they got at the end. So yes, uh, and I also see a few questions the chat i don't know um, we'll do that um, shortly uh, yes. I like we're going to moderate that i want to and i'm going to close this off uh, with just one quick more personal question um and that is um looking at your website um i noticed your life motto which you you, you uh, display there which i quite like it comes from picasso although you've told me it might come from someone else but we think picasso the purpose of life is to search for your passion and share it can you say a word or two about that Oh yes, absolutely. Um, I think those um, uh, those who uh, who manage to uh, to identify find um, this thing that makes them wake up early in the morning or stay up. For me, I'm more an, an I night owl rather than a skylark, right? Uh, um, uh, or stay up late at night, uh, not because you know, uh, not because we have to, but because we we believe in it, right? Uh, um, they have a, a happy life, right? And this is, uh, or uh, that's one thing. And they also, um, they also, uh, they also uh, deliver greatness, deliver excellence, uh, right? They have no problem uh, working on things uh, which are difficult and uh, overcome obstacles, and so on and so on. And this is uh, this has been something that uh, if, if for us, for me, for I think I, I speak also for you, Mark, right? Uh, negotiation has uh, has become exactly. Uh, exactly our passion yes it's the reason why we get up in the morning someone recently asked me i don't remember who it was what is your why yeah. why do you do this why do you invest so much of your time in uh, in all these competitions why do you uh, deal with this negotiation stuff uh, uh, <laughs> i i thought I, it made me think for a while and i told him uh, because this is my my tiny little contribution to making our world a little bit better yeah, a little Not bit no Thank you. Um, I'd like to move maybe to opening the floor to questions. If you have questions, please put them in the chat or you can just raise your hand and ask them. Uh, Philippe will be moderating for us. Um, and uh, anything at all about what, uh, about what uh, has been said or anything else. So please, um, everybody, if you have a, a question to address to uh, Remy, please write it in the, in the chat. There was one written by uh, Joshua which made me think about um, a Polish um, philosopher and, and sociologist I had the chance to, to meet uh, some years ago called Zygmunt Bauman. Mm -hmm. And Zygmunt Bauman was, uh, at the time, he was writing an article about um, local, localism, globalism, and he came up with the neologism global, <laughs> mixing both. And when I met him, there was also a a sociologist who just wrote a book called the McDonald the McDonaldization of the world and he was writing a book about consumers and pro producers and he was also he also came up with the neologism prosumers right to mix both so joshua's question is about um the word competition is it the right word that we should use and he proposes the term um Co-opetition, <laughs> co-opetition. So, what do you think of that, uh, Remy? Uh, and John, do you want to add something to that before Remy answers? Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Philippe. Um, yeah, Remy, hi. Thanks so much for this. Um, though, just to, uh, to preface this, um, so a few years back, I, I did the Warsaw negotiation competition as a judge, which was an interesting experience, and. Um, you know, I, I think that's evolved and, and grown in, in some interesting ways. I mean, when I was there, they didn't really give us guidelines in terms of what was a 10 and what was a one. And so 
you know, and I brought this up to the other judges and said, you know, how are you categorizing a 10? Uh, and, and we were all over the map. And so we talked about that with the organizers. And I think they sort of came up with, you know, a little more standards. But the bigger question is, you know, and, and I like all of you, when I do trainings for companies or organizations or governments or whatever it is, and I ask them the question, how many of your negotiations are one off versus with the same people, the same organizations over time? Generally, and again, it's going to vary from industry to industry, obviously, but generally it's about 10 to 15 percent are one off negotiations. And in those realms, obviously, you know, that sort of that notion of competing and the relationship doesn't really matter is okay. And, and, and obviously all negotiations are a mix of competition and cooperation. I, I guess the biggest thing for me and the question is really, you know, and I, I'm increasingly interested in the psychological realm as it all applies to this. Cause I think so much of negotiation goes on there and we don't talk nearly enough about it. Um, when we call something a, a competition, we're predisposing people to certain ways of approaching things. Right. And we want them to, you know, make sure they're meeting their interests and asserting for themselves, things like that. And yet we also want them to not do that at the expense of the relationship with people. So I guess that's the question. Have you ever considered sort of a slightly different way of, it sounds like in practice you do that and, and you encourage people when they're there, but but I wonder if there's a way of perhaps not setting them up so much to be thinking <laughs> that this is all a competition and yada, yada, yada. Yeah, I think you get the question and you get oh, the yeah. idea. So I'd love to I'd love to hear what your thoughts are. Joshua, thank you so much for this question. This, uh, this is, uh, has been very central for us ever since the beginning. So we called, uh, we called our competition the negotiation challenge. Oh, <laughs> and okay. it was not without the reason, <laughs> not without the reason, right? Because, uh, um, the moment uh, many people, uh, many students, we notice many students, uh, competition raises interest. Yeah, competition raises interest. So marketing, marketing wise, it's uh, mm -hmm. probably a more success would would have been a more successful uh, way of um, let's say of naming what we do what we do. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, we decided against it. We decided to call the negotiation challenge because you know because of our underlying philosophy. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, um, still, many people call it. Uh, many people call it still negotiation competition. I think that's that seems to be the category of activities that we're um, uh, that we typically are assigned to, and that's okay. I think that's okay as long as it's uh, it's transparent. Uh, what are the, what, what what the criteria are based on which we measure negotiation performance? So we are back to square one. We are back to square one. I think uh, many competitions, uh, many competitions, you know either do not have fixed criteria or have criteria which are not based on science, right? Or, you know, uh, uh, leave it completely up to the judges, you know, make it then completely discretionary and so on and so on. We wanted to have certain scientific basis, right? Uh, for um, for determining what kind of performance uh, or observable behavior typically correlates with uh, superior performance. And, uh, and uh, um, at the end of the day, the results of a negotiations of a negotiation matter yes uh, because you know our salary matters because revenue matters because costs matter yeah and so on and so on so or the results matter but uh, it all boils down to what we call the result and this is the debate which we wanted to trigger with the paper with the competition and so on we have uh we're maybe slightly skewed into a uh a competition in cooperation uh, type of a, a, a type of an activity right because we believe that it relationships uh, relationships uh, are um, rarely one off they are they have to, they, they tend to have a future right and future matters and if future matters then you need to and so on and so on right so exactly what uh, what you mentioned in your intro so um, but at the end of the day we want to be able to capture Yes, uh, the impact that uh, someone's behavior has on uh, the perception of their negotiation partner. Yes. Uh, so we decided we decided to include that in the uh, in the assessment scheme. And ever since we did that, uh, we've observed exactly, let's say, that the winning teams or the teams that end up on top uh, seem to have exactly the same values that we want to promote. Yeah? Mm. So it's right. a kind of a... 
Yeah. Very encouraging, I'm sure. Yeah. Yes. So it's a, it's a kind of a design versus design slash assessment criteria slash underlying philosophy, uh, philosophy things. But uh, for us, it has always been, it has always been a part of uh, our mission yeah, to promote a certain type of a negotiation in a context that uh, that is attractive to, to to participants. We want participants to register. We want them to come. We want them to enjoy it. But at the same time, we want them to leave uh, with a certain message in the back of our, of their mind, and that is, hey, wow! Not only I met I, I, I met uh, lots of passionate negotiators from around the world, but I learned how to be a better version of myself in the process. I had a student, I, Joshua, I, one of uh, during the finals in Rome. One of the students came up to me wiping tears from his eyes yeah and he said well uh, thank you so much for putting it together yeah? the process the preparation process and your competition has been so rewarding i'm a completely different person now yeah? hmm. and this is exactly this this to me this this is the highlight and none of the published pa none of the papers that i've published <laughs> courses that i've taught have been as rewarding as those moments mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Remy. There is someone in the chat who actually found the, the solution. It's a Greek solution, so I, I'm, I'm unable to pronounce it properly. Maybe Vaya can, but she she wrote uh, she, she wrote there is there is a term in ancient Greek, uh, eulenos amilla, so, something like this, that translates roughly to good sportsmanship. Uh, so that's maybe the the best way to call it, to call it. Um, is there any other questions from the chat? I don't see any other one, but I have a quick one because I, I, I have to tell you, Remy, I, I was surprised because the first question Mark addressed you um, was clearly about ethics. And you, you, you told us a lot about the importance of ethics. And the second one was about Chris Voss. And um, I was expecting you to be much harder with uh, our beloved Chris. And you surprisingly to me you, you defended him although when i i wrote him uh, quite recently he reminded me of a lot of things that that are in a very popular french book called uh, petit traité de manipulation à l'usage des honnêtes gens uh, it's it's written by two french famous psychosociologists so psychosociology or social psychology is the among all social sciences, the most specialized in manipulation. Um, and they, they give very clearly uh, manipulation techniques. And, and when I was reading uh, and watching also the, the masterclass Chris Voss made, a lot of the tricks he uses are manipulation tricks. So, so why stressing that much on ethics and why being so, uh, so Voschian? If I may. <laughs> Thank you for this question, uh, Philippe. Uh, it's uh, it's a hard one. It's a tough one. Uh, you guys uh, uh, make me uh, make me uh, sweat and think in this uh, warm <laughs> weather here in Hamburg. So, <clears throat> see, there is a reason why you guys started this uh, this chat with "Please to notice." Yes. And I and this I I, I share uh, very much. I, I I share this uh, this view, right? That if uh, um, people, uh, those of us who tend to think, who tend to notice good things in everything, uh, and uh, end up living ha a happier life than those uh, than those who uh, you know tend to see always, always uh, worse things. So I, I do think that uh, the the uh, and plus uh, one of the underlying principles of logic is that uh, uh, it's induction, right? Uh, is that we can learn based on wrong premises, right? <laughs> so, so even even if the premise is wrong, we can still learn. So um, and putting this all together, um, uh, I did enjoy reading Chris Paul, uh, um, and you know, um, uh, my um, my thoughts were um, um, first of all, um, can we can do we have evidence that it works? And some some of the things for some of the things we do based on you know the work that uh, that other colleagues uh, have done in the past for some of the things we have evidence to the contrary. But then a second thought was, uh, but if it's effective, why is it effective? And uh, so I thought about uh, you know maybe we don't know everything about uh, about this approach yet. Maybe we need to do some more research or 
or are we maybe trying to generalize n equals one to n equals all? And this is a, so it's we're somewhere in between. Uh, we're somewhere in between, uh, somewhere there in between, right? Uh, uh, which means uh, um, I do uh, I, I do admire Chris for uh, for generating so much buzz uh, for our field uh, for being so successful in it, and uh, I do like uh, I do like his work. And at the same time, I'm a scientist. Uh, I'm a scientist, and I. Uh, um, um, I uh, prefer to teach things that uh, really do work, yes, yeah. uh, rather than things that uh, sell well. Yes, uh, I do not have a story behind me, right? So uh, saying uh, saying on a podcast on the show, "Hey, I'm a scientist. Listen to me." This is not as sexy as, "Hey, I've negotiated with terrorists and uh, listen to me." Right. So probably most of most most of you guys, if there was a uh, if there was a crisis uh, a crisis negotiator. Um, having a parallel session to this one, probably you would decide to uh, to listen to the other one because of the story that uh, uh, that he or she would have to tell. Um, nevertheless, if uh, we look for the rules that, uh, that 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 need to govern our behavior or modifications of our behavior, right? Uh, I tend to uh, I tend to like the rules that are based on scientific evidence. Yeah, based on scientific evidence. Last thought, uh, Philippe. Last thought. Very last thought. It is impossible not to influence mm -hmm. yes and that's uh, um, the extent to which we we call our behavior influence or manipulation uh, or where the threshold between influence and manipulation uh, is is very hard to define mm -hmm. in negotiation the parties have sometimes conflicting goals but at the same time they can only achieve them if if their negotiation partner agrees, right? So ultimately, um, the title of the mo the most famous negotiation book already suggests influence, or if you'd like to manipulation. <clears throat> if you like to call it manipulation, you could call it manipulation. It's getting to yes. It's changing the behavior towards accepting something that. Uh, uh, that we believe is beneficial, that meets our interests, and so on and so on. So it's a very, very thin line between, you know, um, when do we influence each other and, and from which point we start manipulating, uh, manipulating each other, especially in the context of negotiation, where we have our vested interests, which sometimes are opposing. Mm -hmm. And on that Thank note, I think we are... Very much for your oh, answer. Mark. Me, Mark, please go on. I was going to say, let's uh, let's finish on that note. It's a very strong note. Um, and uh, I kind of want to watch the time here. Uh, two things to close out. One is I'm going to put something up that um, you may want to have a look at. That's our thank you to you for coming. Uh, and we hope that you'll want to uh, keep in touch with us. Uh, and there's all sorts of ways you can do that. Please check out our website at rationalgames.com. You'll find uh, our blog. You'll find uh, information about our trainers. You'll see a TEDx talk that I did a few years ago. We are a social business. We support nonprofits. Um, so have a look at that, uh, and please just screenshot this if you'd like it. And and uh, I also just it. sent it in the chat. I, I will send it again. So you can, if if you want to keep touch with us, you can. Um, this this is the way. This is our book. And for Remy, and only for Remy, we have a special a special small gift um, to thank you because you are now part of the powerhouse community, and you will receive in your mail a personalized uh, mug assigned by all of the your host and co-host for you to drink coffee in the future and think of us so thank you so much for a kind invitation it wasn't even necessary i um uh, utterly enjoyed our our conversation thank you so much thank you very much for coming and thanks to everyone for supporting thank you very me. much yeah Check with us early june is the next powerhouse uh, we're working we're negotiating the speaker <laughs> all right coming. thank you so much bye-bye